May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, by a show of hands, and don't be bashful, by a show of hands, how many of y'all are familiar with the musical Fiddler on the Roof? Go ahead and raise your hands. Great, so it's not going to wig you out when I sing Tradition, Tradition. Choir, come on in. Tradition, Tradition. I probably should have prepped him before I did that first, but... Tradition, how does that word sound to you? How does it sound? I imagine for some of us that word offers us a kind of peace and, and a kind of stability, uh, assurance. For others, it might be the opposite. We might hear that word and cringe, Ugh, tradition. We think of something fixed and sterile and cold and distant. And there might be others still that it's even more complex than that as it's some kind of combination of those things. Tradition can be a heavy word. It comes with a lot of baggage. G.K. Chesterton articulating the gift of tradition uh, tradition once penned these words. Tradition is only democracy extended through time. Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. Tradition is the democracy of the dead. I just love that. I love that for two reasons. The first, the idea of honoring those ancestors who went before us, and two, for those of us whose ancestors were not given the right to vote in their time, whose voices were silenced, we can listen to them now. We need to listen to them now, as they can inform, if not transform, our tradition. A democracy for the dead. Jesus, the Pharisees, asked, why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders? and wash their hands before eating. Here we go again. The Pharisees and others trying to back Jesus into a corner, trying to get him on some moralistic technicality, and it was important to them. This washing thing, it was a big deal. So big, in fact, that they organized their lives around this and other purity codes so that they could live before others in this like continual state of holiness and purity. This tradition was one way they stood out and above others and they snubbed those who didn't adhere to their level of purity or their way of understanding the scriptures. And we all do this. We all do this on some level, right? Every religion, every expression of faith, every denomination somewhere in our speech or lurking somewhere in the corners of our minds is this thought. Well, our way is better. We got it, right? And then we other people, right? Uh, if only those other people, if only those other churches, those other denominations did what we did, dot, dot, dot. But here in our gospel story this morning, these Pharisaic traditions, these holiness codes had taken that way of thinking to a much darker and more damaging level as they were used to condemn and even alienate people from their families and alienate people from their community. And in some instances, they were even used as vehicles for economic exploitation of the poorest of the poor, the most fragile among them. So when Jesus hears this question about the disciples not washing their hands, he knows it's way more about all that other baggage and less about the particularity of some specific action you do before supper. And in response to the Pharisees appealing to their tradition, rooted in power and privilege and position, Jesus responds by appealing to the democracy of the dead. And he invokes the voices of the prophets of old, the tradition of the prophetic imagination. Jesus said, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human traditions as doctrines. And then he calls the people to gather around him and says, it's not about what goes inside of you that is defiling. It is all about what comes out of you. It's about our hearts. 
And again, you hear in his words the conjuring of these prophetic voices, voices like Amos. I despise your festivals and your solemn assemblies. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness be an ever-flowing stream. Voices like Hosea, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than offerings. And the voice of uh, 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 Micah who said, he has told you, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before your God. Because if our traditions aren't leading us to that way of life, if our traditions aren't placing us in a loving and humble posture before God and other, t- other people, it's time to rethink our traditions. I've been listening to a podcast the past few weeks. Maybe some of you have too. It's one of the most popular right now out there. It's called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. For those of you who don't know, Mars Hill grew to be one of the largest and most influential evangelical churches in our country until its collapse in 2014. It fascinates me because uh, I grew up evangelical from the age of 19 until Eric and I walked into an Episcopal church in our mid-20s. The Mars Hill influence was all around me. It was at conferences and local churches and my reading in conversations with friends and pastors. It was everywhere, this Mars Hill brand, Mars Hill theology and teaching. And it's undeniable that at first Mars Hill Church transformed lives and, 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 and created community. But over time, as it grew and it grew, it became a kind of machine. And the leadership revolved around a pastor who expected utter loyalty without accountability and complete adherence to his teaching, which over time became increasingly misogynistic and homophobic and spiritually abusive. Yet he remained a coveted speaker at ministry conferences, a best-selling author, and continued to receive accolades and pats on the backs from all the popular pastors all over the nation. Why? Because the American church is really good at sacrificing integrity on the altar of success. See, Mars Hill used scriptural proof texting in the language of covenant. They expected their members to follow their traditions. They, of course, didn't call them that word. They didn't call them traditions because they were astute marketers. But that's what they were, traditions, teaching human traditions as doctrines. Marriage has got to look like this. If not, you're out. Parenting has got to look like this. If not, you're out. Membership has got to look like this. If not, you're out. Tithing, it's got to look like this. If not, you're out. And if you ask questions, if you challenge the leadership in any way, you were labeled a heretic and you were shunned, literally shunned. And churches across the country imitated and followed it every step of the way. And guess what? Some still do leaving behind them a wake of abused and alienated and traumatized people. Which shows us, whether it be in the first century or the 21st century, tradition can be a democracy for the dead or it can be a tyranny for the living. Over the past year I've been here, I and our other clergy have heard stories from people who have been wounded by that kind of tyranny, if not abused by the church. In my personal life, I've gotten a front row seat to that kind of pain. So if you are visiting us this morning or have for quite some time and that's part of your story, I'm sorry. And we know how incredibly hurtful that can be. The Episcopal Church is not a perfect denomination And St. Andrew's is not a perfect church. We are a beloved community filled with imperfect people. And we do not, do not have all the answers. Church is not like that Jerry Maguire movie where we stand in front of the church like Tom Cruise in front of Renee Zellweger and say, you complete me. Church does not complete us. And I believe any church that takes that kind of posturing ceases to be the church and fashions an idol of itself. Because only God can complete us. 
But I can say this without hesitation. You will be loved here. And we will walk with you on this grace-filled journey we call faith. And yes, we have our traditions, and some of them might seem and look a little quirky and dated, but they are not heavy loads tied to our back. These traditions of ours, we participate in them so we may be shaped more and more into the image of Christ and be filled with God's love for all. For all, without exception. These traditions for us, they are not only the democracy of the dead, but lead us to the one who is the hope for the living. Amen.